because I like recording my meetings and putting them online. Mm. If that's okay with you. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I hope so. Uh, if not, tell me. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so please um, uh, let me introduce, because uh, I've already shared information about you to, to our group, and I would like to present you um, Dr. Jason Sparks and uh, Dr. Funda Guven. So Jason Sparks is our uh, um, Vice Dean uh, at the Graduate School of Education, and he is the lead of this uh, small task force, uh, and he'll be providing you more um, like information about it. Uh, and Dr. Funda Guven is our uh, professor, uh, from the Department of um, Kazakh and Turkish Studies at the School of uh, Social Sciences Humanities. Um, so I think we we're ready to start. Yeah, yeah. I'm all ready. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Stephen, thank you very, very much for, for your time. And um, so I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. So uh, we're from Nazarbayev University here in uh, what was Astana, Kazakhstan, and now it is Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan. And uh, our university is, is relatively young, so we're in our 10th year, if I'm not mistaken, for the undergraduates. I've been here for eight years in the graduate programs. And uh, like universities all around the world, uh, we've been you know, in the throes of this online learning and teaching experience. And uh, I think our university has recognized that this is also an opportunity uh, to maybe, uh, capitalize on some of the you know, expertise and re, you know, innovations that we've all been forced to create over the last few months as, and in the hopes of moving back to a you know, place-based campus experience. And really our task force is tasked with uh, doing a little inquiry and coming up with a report for our school on what would be the ideal learning environment for our students in the next five years. And uh, they really, the university really does want to put this into a kind of action plan and start to fund some of these things. And so we're mm -hmm. really meant to provide a kind of vision and a little bit of a game plan for doing that. Our, our discussion with you today is really focused on some of these visionary things, where we might go and what some of the trends are that could help guide us. And we know, we know you're someone who's going to be able to help us here. So thanks very, very much. Um, so... I mean, we, we have a couple of the obvious questions to get started with, but first I wonder, uh, what do you think of this uh, task force that we are, this idea of a task force like us tasked with doing this? Oh, well, it's a good idea. I mean, uh, I'm just reading earlier today the old saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. um, and that's certainly what we have. And, you know, the advantage of the last year and some is that we've been forced to reconsider some of the practices that we thought, you know, could never change, couldn't yeah. imagine changing them. And we've been forced to change them. And we've had to do it in a hurry and, uh, you know, and haven't always responded as well as we could have, but it gives us this broader perspective and gives us the opportunity to, to bring in some of the lessons. Uh, having a task force in particular to look at it is a good way of focusing your efforts. Uh, I'm working on the assumption that, um, you know, you're looking at getting this broad-based representation both within the membership of the task force as well as uh, from the perspectives that you're getting. And I'm hoping that you're speaking to people not only that are involved in the uh, university system or the academic system, but also uh, some of those who are outside the system uh, who perhaps for the last two years were uh, prevented from accessing the system for one reason or another, mm -hmm. or perhaps people who were prevented from accessing the system the way it was before and might find new opportunities with some of the methods that have been adopted during the last year. That, that's very interesting, actually. Uh, I mean, obviously it's interesting, but I hadn't, we, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. 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 It's you. surprising how few people do, and it's a point yeah. that I've taken to trying to remind people that, you know, the, the, uh, the audience, the, the target population, the demographics, whatever, of a university aren't, is not composed just of the people in the university. It's the entire community. Great. 
Yeah, speaking about the membership and like uh, diversity within the membership, we uh, have three more of our members of the task force uh, joining us today. Mm -hmm. So I will just briefly introduce you to them. Uh, Warren Rocco is the deputy director of the Center of Preparatory Studies. He is the co-lead of this uh, task force. Uh, Ricardo Braganza, uh, he's our graphic uh, uh, instructional designer. And we, together with him, like me and I, oh, Ricardo and I are working in the same unit of Innovative Learning Hub. Um, and Miruer Bijanova, she is the representative of the students in this um, task force. Awesome. And so for those of you who just joined, no, you were not late. I was early. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. And thank you, Iman, for organizing this. It's okay. wonderful. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, this is great. Thanks very much. And so, uh, yeah, I guess we did start a little bit early, and I'm sorry about that, guys. So uh, we, we just started out with this kind of ice-breaking question, but we're curious, you know, what Stephen thought of our task force and the work, and that was very that was a great answer. We also got some good suggestions there. Well, um, and if it, I'm, I'll ask a couple of the obvious questions, but I, I'm I'm hoping this is a real conversation among us all. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, the, but so Stephen, what do you think? So again, we're tasked with uh, describing uh, what the ideal learning environment might be or could be in five years. What do you think of, could be, what is an ideal learning environment to you and, you know, for a university situation? Well, I guess my first remark would be something like, you know, the ideal learning environment is different for every learner. Um, you know, even among the people I'm looking at here today, you're coming from different backgrounds, different perspectives. Uh, perhaps of different income levels, um, maybe speak different languages. I don't know about linguistic diversity in Kazakhstan, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, and some will be living in cities, some will be living in rural areas, some will have good bandwidth and connectivity, others will not. Um, you know, there's lots of debate about learning styles, and I won't go into that, but some people prefer to learn through conversations. Some people prefer to learn through reading directions and trying to make something, you know, there's all kinds of different approaches. So I think that the ideal learning environment, right off the bat, before we get into any specifics, uh -huh. will have to be something that allows for individual modes of participation. And by individual, I don't mean just doing it by yourself, but I mean um, individually selected modes of participation as much as possible. Um, yeah, that's, everybody's talking about, um, we want to get back to doing our classes in person and uh and would maybe take some lessons and you know <laughs> they talk about that in the workplace as well we want to get back to the workplace in person and i i look at my employers and say no you can't make me go back there <laughs> uh, i'm happy here uh I, i'm working from my own home i'm in my own office i'm comfortable here um, I have a nice chair. I have better bandwidth than in the office. I have cats. They won't let me have cats in the office, and I need cats. Um, you know, and I think the same is true of education. You know, creating a requirement that people show up at a specific time in a specific place, and then for whatever reasons that's done, and there are reasons why that's done, it also creates a barrier to some people, not to all people. And certainly many people prefer that, but you know, it's, it's, I think necessary to think about what happens if you can't show up at the right place at the right time. Does that mean you don't get an education? I think that's not really an ideal outcome. Right. Right. You've, you've written about, um, and, and worked, um, quite a bit, um, examining personal learning environments. I, I wonder what you haven't communicated that's, that's, that's key to your study there that connects with the, with, the, with the response that you just gave to, to Jason for us. What I haven't communicated. 
that's a hard question. What haven't I communicated? I'm one of these people. If I have an idea, I'll share it. And then later on, I'll think about whether it was a good idea. Uh, but so maybe I've, I've maybe actually or, or where there's some connective tissue there, maybe. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been working on this concept of a personal learning idea or personal learning environment for a long time. And I've messed around with code. I've messed around with my own application. I've looked at the different concepts. And it's really hard. And, and I'll admit it. Um, one thing I said just yesterday um, in a presentation, so I guess it's not something I haven't said, but it's something I hadn't said until yesterday. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I gave a talk about connectivism and I said, you know, doing it the traditional way, um, more personalization is harder. It means more things. It means adding things. It means extra languages. It means extra modes of uh, communication, uh, customization, creating additional choices. But personalizing things the connectivist way means less. Uh, it means fewer rules, uh, fewer restrictions, fewer constraints. Um, you know, I, I've set up my system so that it's very customizable for the individual. And what that means for the institution is they don't need to worry so much about um, presenting content in all of these different ways. They provide the basic information and then the individual learner creates the environment, creates the context, and even the activities around that content uh, for themselves. Now, that's still hard. Um, and to create an application that does that is still hard. No such application exists. But on the other hand, we have the whole internet. Uh, we've got tons of tools available to us. And this is something we've always done with connectivism and our, our uh, MOOCs is to try to use these other tools as much as possible. There's frustrations there, you know, because if the more tools you use, the more login IDs you have to have. And students find that very frustrating. I find that very frustrating. And so that, that's a concern. But it's better than trying to bring everybody in to one centralized tool like one centralized learning management system, or even something sprawling like Google Classroom with all of its applications or you know, the Microsoft environment. So, you know, I, I think that's maybe the, you know, yes, we're a big unsaid thing. The big unsaid thing is that um, you create a lot of advantages, especially for the institution, but also for the student. If you decouple, the institution's environment from the individual's environment and allow those to be different and, and not try to control the individual's environment as much as you might be inclined to. I don't know if that's the kind of answer you wanted, but that's the best I could come up with for that question. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. You're, you're suggesting a lot of, um, you're suggesting a lot of autonomy there. You're suggesting a lot of uh, investing a lot of trust in uh, course designers, uh, mm -hmm. in instructors, even in students. I heard you suggest yeah. some of the role that students can play in perhaps materializing, um, resourcing, teaching, even even assessing maybe mm -hmm. the courses to which they belong. And that's there's a lot of moving parts there. There's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And um, I imagine there's a lot of in investing that kind of trust, there's a lot of responsibility that that is required at multiple levels in order to achieve, I think, this wonderful vision that you're just sort of, you're giving us definitely some very critical, some, some critical broad strokes here to sort of motivate us. Um, but I can also see how complicated that, that is going to be to live into. Um, well, well, and to be very frank, I mean, most people, haven't received the, the training and development, to use a phrase, that they need in order to function in such an environment. 
and most people um, you know have been trained through their lives to follow directions and I assume that's true in Kazakhstan I certainly know that it's true in Canada and, and you know we're we're a pretty unrestrained kind of nation where you know if we can set off on our own we will uh, but we still follow directions and that's how we've learned how to learn so you know it's not like you're going to suddenly switch from what you're doing to this kind of vision that would be terrible advice and i would never give it um so but the idea here is to see what the end point is and you did begin this by saying you know what would the ideal environment be well that's the ideal environment but you're not going to get there in september um no one's going to get there in september but if you have this as a target, or at least among your targets, because, you know, again, there are many different priorities in an educational system, then you can begin to say things like, uh, what things could we do to enable greater autonomy and greater responsibility, right? Um, you know, what actions can we take? Um, how are we going to evaluate these actions to make sure that you know, they're actually feasible. Um, you know, what can we build into how we're training people? And again, I don't like these word training people, but I'm going to because to a certain degree, you know, being autonomous, uh, being a, uh, you know, somebody who knows how to learn, this is a skill. You know, yeah. this isn't, you know, people act as though, well, it takes a certain special sort of person to be able to work autonomously and on their own and develop their own learning. And that's not true. It takes a person who has learned those skills over time. They've learned skills, simple skills like time management, although I'm not one to talk about time management, but more important skills like being willing to ask questions, uh, being curious about things, uh, doing the work, uh, practice, um, you know, developing the habit of doing something every day on an ongoing basis. That's, you know, that's not, doesn't take a special kind of person to do. It takes time and effort. Um, and, you know, for most of us, the appropriate guidance. So setting that sort of framework, what do people need to be able to do? What does our system need to be able to do? Um, that that creates the target. You know, from a systemic perspective, um, you know, it could be something simple like um, allowing people to select more courses as electives or whatever. I mean, that's a bad example, but you get the idea, right? Um, you know, uh, a lot of colleges, certainly, uh, and I don't know about your system in particular, but uh, uh, in Canada, we have community colleges and they have very prescribed sets of courses that you have to take. And so creating greater autonomy means uh, in that list of courses, allowing students to take different courses. Now, most universities have great freedom, flexibility of selecting courses. But if you didn't say, then you would want to think about, okay, how do we enable this greater freedom? And you'd have to plan for that. You know, what does it take to offer more courses that people can select from in time? Staffing, resourcing, scheduling, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff. Or a more concrete example, um, what would it take to allow a student to be able to take a course completely online? or if there is an in-person component to be able to schedule that flexibly to fit their own schedule. And again, you, you run it as a mental exercise, right? Suppose we were planning to do this, what would we do? And then that creates targets that you can look at for longer term development, that sort of thing. So it sounds like, uh one of the key one of the features of an ideal learning environment would be uh, one that uh, plans for enabling students to uh, have greater autonomy and help uh, develop students to be the kind of learners that you imagine you want 
right? That's correct. And, and ultimately, ultimately, I mean, if it were me, and it isn't, <laughs> but if it were me, um, I would actually want to change the focus of learning from being defined as a body of content to being defined by what participants in the learning want to do. And that's, that's a little bit hard to get a handle on. It's a lot easier if you talk about more specific instances of learning, um, like you know maybe project-based learning or something like that. But the idea here is that the end goal of the learning is maybe to, to build something, to create something, to accomplish something, to become something. And there's a great deal of flexibility here because out there in the world, there's a large number of jobs and positions and uh, you know even hobbies or projects that people can do. Uh, needs that they have and then as a person is developing the capacity to do these things they will need various support learning support and they don't know ahead of time what they'll need you can kind of plan on it but you don't know ahead of time what they're going to want to do mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's why we just settle on subjects, right? Because it's easier. Um, but if we're creating greater flexibility, what we want, at least in my world, is to help as much as possible the individual to define what it is that they want to do, or at least the direction they want to go, because people are going to change their mind. I changed my mind, so I assume other people will want to change their mind. Um, they follow what could be called a strange attractor, right? There's, there's always something attracting people, goals, desires, needs, whatever, but it's a strange attractor. It, it isn't just a single point. It moves and bounces around and they follow this through the course of their lives. So you can't really predict what it is they're going to want to do, but whatever it is at any given time, they're gonna have needs. And the role of the institution in this sort of picture is to best provide for those needs. Mm -hmm. Now, again, you can pull back from that ideal picture, uh, for example, by saying, well, look, we're not going to support just any kind of thing people want to become. We're going to focus on, say, you know, people wanting to become lawyers of different types or people wanting to become medical professionals or whatever, right? Uh, you, you, that might be an intermediate step. But in the long term, in the educational system as a whole, and not just your institution, really what we want to do is support people in these endeavors however they need to be supported. And now we, we begin to think about, okay, well, what, what would support look like? Yeah. And, uh, you know, would it involve a conference like this? You know, how many students have the opportunity to have a conference like this with a panel of experts? It never happens. Um, you know, uh, would it be one-on-one uh, -on -one tutorial support? Um, would it be guided instructions to build something, you know, with videos and, and you know, how-tos and things like that? Um, would it be uh, Richard Feynman videos about fundamental particles in physics? Uh, which I strongly recommend, by the way. Uh, you know, any of these things. And, you know, uh, again, you can't list them all. You can't create them all ahead of time. So you find your institution in the process of responding to these needs dynamically, uh, often, you know, with, you know, unpredictable, unpredictable days on the part of the staff. Well, you know, the, the student needs come in, you respond to them. But as you're doing this, you're also creating this very large library of content um, that, again, can be used and reused 
or you know you can apply artificial intelligence to it and mine it for new ideas etc um you know again far future right we're talking ideals here so you begin by thinking the role of the institution is to support the learner in their learning endeavor and then you you begin asking what that looks like and that's different from saying the role of the institution is to te teach people X, Y, and Z. And you know, as soon as you make that conceptual flip, uh, the world looks completely different. At least it did to me. Wow. And I, oh, I just, I just want to quickly sum up, and then I, then I don't want to, uh, then I want someone else to talk. But I just wanted to note that in asking about the ideal learning environment you really focused on learning and learners uh, you said the role of the institution is to support the learner uh, allowing for the diversity and also uh, then enabling learners to become those autonomous learners maybe developing them in some skills and uh, helping them do what they want to do i just wanted to add, say that but that, i think that's very interesting yeah. it was all about learning and learner okay i'm sorry i think i interrupted somebody no, no, I just wanted to uh, to maybe ask with, with additionally something. So, um, you know, Dr. Downs, uh, when we had the meeting with uh, Dr. Uh, Kurt Bonk from Indiana University, uh, he, Bonk, was, yeah. Yeah, he was the one who actually told us, if you guys want to be aware of all the current and emerging trends in higher education, you need to subscribe to um, Stephen Downs' blog. So what I did, actually, and uh, the the one trend especially, specifically that I just like, that comes to my mind uh, every time I, I read your blogs is learning analytics, but also, mm -hmm. Uh, it, I would just like to ask, what do you see as the real must have for the higher education um, in terms of having a, like, you know, like a must have for learning and teaching, but in terms of uh, ed tech trends? But in terms of? It, uh, like educational technology or some. Okay, yeah. Oh, the one must have. <laughs> like maybe uh, seven, <laughs> three, four. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, let me think. But I mean, the very first thing that comes to my mind is bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, if you don't have bandwidth, it becomes really hard to do anything. And so, you know, you need the infrastructure for that bandwidth. You need power. You need computers to use that bandwidth. I know I'm talking about pretty basic stuff, but you said the one thing that all institutions need, you can't do any of this stuff without that. You know, if I were going to my minister and I had a university and I was going to my minister and I was asking for funding, um, you know, on the technology side, I'd, I'd be putting most of my effort into making sure I get adequate bandwidth. And, you know, we can make do with $10 computers, but we can't make do with 300 baud bandwidth. It's just not feasible. So that, that would be the first thing. That would be the key thing. Uh, you know, uh, you can do so much, literally with, a, well, I think they're $14 now, but you know, the Raspberry Pi or whatever, you can do so much with really simple computers. Um, but the bandwidth is the key. So that'd be the first thing. Uh, beyond that, I mean, you know, and everyone's going to say something like this, and I'm not going to disagree. Um, there has to be a good uh, how do I want to phrase it? Because everybody's going, what everybody's going to say is, your staff have to be trained to use the technology. But I don't mean that. Um, what I mean is that uh, the staff at the university have this relationship with the tools that is very comfortable and very familiar. And that's a hard concept, but that's what you need. And I'll define it by analogy. In the previous generation, our previous generation of faculty and staff had that relationship with books, 
right? Um, a faculty member or an educated person would never see a book as this challenge to be overcome. Mm -hmm. No, a book is an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. A book is this thing you can approach. Uh, sure, you could read it from beginning to end, but that's a very dull way of approaching a book. Uh, you know, a book is a resource. You can do things with it. It stimulates thoughts. It allows you to be creative. You build things off of it. It helps you make your own books, right? So that kind of fluency is needed with technology, is, is needed with, um, you know, the tools that we use for learning today. And so I don't mean learning to use this tool or that tool well, but rather, I mean it in the sense of each new tool, each new application is like a new book. It's not this big challenging thing, it's an opportunity. Uh, sure, you could just follow all the instructions on how to use it beginning to end, but that's not a very imaginative way to use a piece of technology right you explore it you do different things with it you try things with it you try to make it do what it wasn't designed to do my favorite story about the internet is that we have built a trillion dollar infrastructure system incredibly complex and incredibly expensive we've devoted entire budgets of countries to build it and we use it to send cat pictures to each other. And that tells me of the kind of fluency that we want. So that, you know, it's, we're so comfortable using it that we use it for the everyday. Um, that's, that's hard to develop. And that kind of culture is hard to develop especially in an academic institution, which has previously so invested in books and is still invested in books and they love books. And I don't blame them, I love books too, you know. But, but that's what you need, that's the second thing you need. And if you have bandwidth and if you have fluency, you have everything. Everything else follows from that. Um, but developing that is hard. Mm. Okay, just one last from my side. Uh, in terms of LMS, cloud-based or server-based? Oh, today? Well, I mean, it depends on the bandwidth you have at your institution, but I'd be looking at cloud-based. Um, so many reasons for that. Um, yeah, it's just so many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, it is hard to maintain a server-based environment. I know because I've done it. Um, you know, simple example, and this happened to me. What happens if your server installation is flagged by anti-spam groups as a spam site? All of a sudden, none of your email messages are being sent anywhere. What do you do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, using cloud-based and hosted services will address things like that. Now, not automatically, but, but you know, it makes it much, that's much easy. easier to handle. Yeah. And, and that's why I switched my email from, you know, self-hosted to cloud-based because all of a sudden, all of my emails were being rejected. Not because I'm a spammer, but because I got flagged as spam and I could not, convince the anti-spam services that I'm not a spammer. Okay. So yeah, cloud. Um, you know, there are other reasons as well. Um, you know, interestingly, from the point of view of your students, it won't make a difference, right? Whether you host the uh, infrastructure or whether you use the cloud, because to them, it's all cloud-based, right? Um, you know, it's just you're building your own cloud infrastructure as compared to using a pre-built cloud infrastructure. Uh, my major caution would be price. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to be on top of that with a cloud-based infrastructure. Um, you know, you have to have safeguards in place to make sure that you're, you don't run price, uh, you know, you don't run through price increases too rapidly. On the other hand, if you have a sudden demand 
you know, a surge of demand, um, you can scale up a cloud environment in a way you can't scale up in the in-house environment. So yeah, I, right now for me, there's no real question. I, I would go cloud. Okay, thank you so much. That's really important to me. <laughs> thank you. I have a question. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. Um, my question is about flexibility to the faculty. So you mentioned flexibility of students. How, uh, how faculty can be flexible in yeah. terms of creativity? That's, that's a terrific question. Um, university faculty are, are really odd. In a, in a particularly unique way in that all of their education and training is for a different job than the one they have. And you might say, well, that's an odd thing to say, but if you think about it, it's true. Take your average um, chemistry professor, okay? The chemistry professor is taking a bachelor's, master's, PhD, advanced study, postdoc, all in chemistry. This person knows everything about chemistry. But what's their job? Teaching. That makes no sense, does it? Um, and that's a really hard concept to grasp. Uh, now, we have people like Tony Bates here in Canada who say, well, look, um, their job is teaching. So every professor should learn how to teach, should be given support in how to teach. And I see the reasoning, but, you know, chemistry professors became chemists because they liked chemistry, not because they like teaching. They're interested in chemistry, not teaching. And you go into any classroom in any university and you'll see the person at the front of the room is interested in their subject far more than they are in the students that are in front of them. I know that's a horrible generalization and sometimes it's not true. I mean, sometimes the, the professors really are engaged in the teaching process, but to a large degree, they're not. And I say that's okay. <laughs> and I, I know that sounds like a terrible thing to say, because, you know, it seems like, well, forget about the students. And that's the opposite of what I'm saying. But now we come to the question of flexibility for professors. What we want of our chemistry professors is that they continue to be the best chemist that they can be. Um, if that's their interest. I mean, if they develop a different interest, we should probably support that as well, you know, within reason, because, you know, they were hired as a chemistry professor. We really expect that. Um, but they're going to want to and be able to, te to contribute to the teaching and learning mandate of the university in different ways. Um, you know, and, I, I did a presentation a while back, you know, the role of the educator. And there are many different roles of educators. Everything from the one-on-one -on -one mentor role to the project management role to the front of the room lecturer role to the administrator and the number cruncher. Some professors of chemistry really discover that they love managing other chemists. You know, it's just the way it is. So, now, this is really hard to accommodate if all of your learning is the same way all of the time. If what you do is offer courses that are taught by a professor and that's it, you can't be flexible. But interestingly, if you take the approach of, you know, we're offering these different kinds of support for students, that allows us to imagine uh, an environment where our professors do different things according to their interests and abilities. Some professors should work directly one-on-one -on -one with students in small research teams. You know, and so you'd set up these research teams, you'd have 
uh, you know, a, a few first year students, a few second year students and so on. And the professor would gather them together and they'd work on projects. MIT Media Labs set up like that, right? Uh, other professors like to lecture, like me. <laughs> um so okay set them up and have them do lectures and have students come in you don't have to make them do a course but you know over the year have them do a course of lectures invite students invite the public you know you have somebody who's good at lecturing about chemistry share that with the community um you know for the management types you know give them management jobs um you know some people like writing they like doing research and papers so you encourage someone doing research and papers and each for each one of those for each one of these professors though they can involve students in what they're doing you know the the lecturing types for example will have students as audiences they might have students follow along as they build their lectures i like to do a lot of my work for example openly and I, I wish I could do it even more openly. You know, I spent, you know, I, I gave a big talk last night on connectivism. It was a two hour talk. And I spent two days solid preparing for that talk. Um, I wish I could have shared that as well as the talk. It was nice to share the talk, but people who are interested, you know, how do ideas get formed? How do you organize things? into a presentation people might have enjoyed seeing it i don't know but you know you only get that possibility if you make that available so you're sort of trying to match things some people like answering questions i i like doing that too um so you, you'd set up you know this chemistry professor he's still doing chemistry but he's going to answer questions oh i mean you just had somebody crash your video <laughs> that was cute that's what I love about everybody working from home. We get to see family members, pets, whatever. I like that a lot. So that's basically my answer. You know, by, by creating flexibility for students, we also create opportunities to create flexibility for our instructors. It was very, it was very interesting, Stephen, because as you were talking, I was thinking, uh, in saying that the uh, chemistry teacher who may not be a great teacher uh, it's not really a problem and then the, the first thing i was thinking of well what about you know the, the role of the institution to support the learner to be autonomous mm -hmm. that they have all of that flexibility in the learning but you, you flipped it and uh not only is the the chemistry teacher who's not necessarily a great teacher not only is that not really a problem he's an asset in another way if you reorganize the entire teaching and learning environment. Yeah. The trick is reorganizing the entire teaching and learning yeah. environment. Not yeah. something you're doing by September. No, Steven, no, no, you, but yeah, that's great. That's that's really helpful. Stephen, right. you've given me a really uh, powerful visual here. I think about sort of the the professor as lecture is almost like a tower of babble, like babbling, right? Oh. Babbling, not nonsense, but but scientific knowledge, for example. Yeah. But lecture upon lecture upon lecture and it's it's kind of stacking the deck singularly where you have this tremendous depth of expertise and you're deploying professors in the same sort of mode and asking them to take on all of these other responsibilities that they're they may or may not be built for or trained for yeah. um, and practice has expanded quite a bit since we've moved to online learning where where, mm -hmm. where these folks have, have learned new skills now. And the visual that you give me is not one of sort of stacking higher, but almost creating like a, a distributed leadership model among teachers, something that's more circular, that's yeah. flat even, um, where you capitalize on the strengths, encourage the strengths and link up professors perhaps who have a weakness, but who have an interest in exploring. You make me think of uh, uh, Mihai, uh, Csikszent Mihai's uh, flow concept right of of bringing sort of like the state of relaxation and a and a, and a sort of a peak of passion together um or, or working on people's um uh, areas of weakness uh, connected to others areas of strengths and doing this kind of professional development within and creating these these, these wonderful teams um who are who are doing more with each other for students 
kids and making the making the team much more dynamic. It's 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 really interesting. I think I think when we sort of pull these threads, I'm I'm really glad we're recording this conversation because I think when we pull some of these threads, these rich threads you're giving us, it's it's going to be a great start for us to to follow through on. That's why I like recording these things. Um, ah. you know, a, a lot of the times the ideas only occur when I'm in a conversation like this. Um, I, I think that's probably true of most people. And the trick is to recognize when the idea happens and then, as you say, pull on the thread. I liked the way you, you brought in the concept of flow. And, you know, we, we think of flow as, as something that applies to the learner, and it does, right? We want to catch that balance between too easy and too challenging and get them right in that channel. But that applies to professors too, you know. Uh, I've seen professors who, you know, have you know spent 20 years coming in teaching the same subject. They're not in flow anymore. They're in stasis, <laughs> you know. They're, they're, and 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 they hate their job. Um, and and you know that's not good for anybody. You know, you you want to challenge and engage and and bring people into this you know creative mode of being whether they're teachers or students. I mean, it works for both. We're talking about what's best for students and we have a student here. I wonder, Meriwet, uh, what do you think about what you're hearing and what, what, what kind of questions do you have for Dr. Downs? So I have one like small question. So first, thank you so much for this health response. Uh, now, like we are facing pandemic, and like COVID-19, it already demonstrated us that uh, uh, all unexpected interruptions, they can change our ways, our learning environment for even 180 degrees. And I'm just wonder what uh, students and what instructor and even a community can do in order to create not only flexible, also at the same time, somehow stable learning environment, you know, that's, that can be like, that can resist any change, any challenge, if such uh, like unexpected situation will happen, and how instructor and students can be really can be prepared. Yeah, that's a hard question. I mean, because it touches on elements of being prepared. It touches on elements of resilience. Um, it touches on elements of capacity. And you know everybody's different in that regard. Um, some people are less able to cope with you know something like a pandemic or you know any disaster. I mean, there was a an earthquake in um, northeastern India today. You know, and that creates an emergency situation for people there. Fortunately, not a bad earthquake, but you know, um, you know, in Canada. About 20 years ago, we had an ice storm, and everything in eastern Ontario and western Quebec was covered with three inches of ice. Uh, you know, what do you do? Um, you know, all the trees started falling and collapsing, the power lines all broke, there was a massive blackout, and it was minus 30 degrees outside. Um, you know, not everybody can cope in an environment like that. So, uh, you know, I think this is advice, good advice generally, um, but, but, but it especially applies in these situations. I mean, the first thing, I mean, well, the first thing is to take care of yourself um, because, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the old story, right? You know, uh, uh, the, the sick doctor cannot heal, um, you know, uh, or if your plane is crashing, get your own oxygen first, then, you know, so that's, that's the first, um, you know, and, you know, some people take that to extremes and that's all they say, you know, look out for yourself and that's it. And that's a terrible way to live, but you have to look out for yourself. Um, I use the expression and I'm not sure if it works in Kazakhstan, but it works in seafaring nations where people used to work on tall ships with sails. And they go up into the mast in the storm to adjust the sails. Um, 
and the ship depends on this, right? But the saying is, one hand for yourself, one hand for the ship. You have to make sure you're hanging on so that you don't fall in order to be able to do your work. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that the reason why you're doing this, the focus all of this is on other people. And you're engaged in a series of relations with other people. Um, and this is especially true during an emergency, but it's always true generally. And again, especially in, in Western societies like Canada and the United States, people say, people look at transactions and you think, how can I benefit from this transaction? And that's exactly the wrong approach, especially during an emergency. Um, and rather, the idea should be to enter any interaction with the perspective, how can I offer value? How can I help the other people? What can I contribute? And it sounds selfless, but it's not. And it's not in two regards. First of all, by contributing, by helping other people, um, you're making society stronger. So during a pandemic, your first thought is, how can I help people during the pandemic? And then you look at the different ways you can help. And everybody's going to be different. Some people can volunteer in medical facilities. Other people can take care of children while their parents volunteer in medical facilities. Um, other people can... Um, you know, provide information for people, uh, you know, write documentation. Other people can help with research, uh, et cetera. But the second thing is that by looking for the best way you can contribute to the wider community, that's also the best way to develop your own capacities, your own expertise, and your own capabilities. Each time you help somebody else, you're becoming better. And you know that does have the practical benefit of making you indispensable to the rest of the community, but it also has the practical benefit of making you a better person. Now, you are asking about something pretty specific, right? How can, you know, how do, how do we respond to something like the pandemic? And I said, well, it means being prepared. The way you're prepared for something like a pandemic is by having this attitude before the pandemic. And I know it's a little late now, we're in the middle of it, but there's going to be another emergency in the future, and the best time to start anything is now. So even if you're not prepared to contribute meaningfully for this pandemic, and not everyone is, and that's okay. Uh, by changing the focus, by beginning to think about how best can I contribute, you know, how best can I can I look to and address someone's needs. That's how to prepare, and and I know that sounds like all kind of a hand wavy answer, but it really is about that, um, you know. I mean, and that's not just me saying it. That's you know. Lao Tzu saying it, that's Gandhi saying it, that's a whole list of people throughout history saying, you know, if you focus on service, you get your own benefits back many times over. Does that help? Is that useful? Yeah, thank you so much. It's speaking to a it's speaking to a, a kind of ethos that I that I love. I think it works for it works in education. It it works. I think it works in just about every facet of life. Um, trying to um, have more people around you who give more than they take or who want to give more than they take. It's a, and it speaks to a values based. It speaks to values based hiring. It speaks to values based teaching and learning. A values based education. Values based love in this regard, friendship, et cetera. Um, 
but it's it's uh, you really are speaking to the future of education because so much of what I think we grow into as learners and maybe as educators is what can I get out of this thing? I'm going to get a document, a degree, a yeah. piece of paper. I need the paper. Yeah, I need to get through this course. It's give me, give me, give me the education. Yeah. And the teacher saying, give me, give me the assignment. And you're speaking to something much more consequential. The converse, the, the design that we have uh, must be consequential. The approach that, that teachers and students alike must, must matter, must be of consequence, right? So that the conversations that we're having, the, the, the way that we materialize a course and teach a course, uh, the way that we assess a course, it has to matter because if it doesn't matter, then why, yeah. why should I care, right? Why should I care about your assessment? If you want me to give, but there's nothing worth giving to or for, mm -hmm. then it, I don't really give a damn, do I? Um, and the, if, it, if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, right? And you're, you're speaking to the question of why, you're speaking to purpose-driven education, the most important thing of all really, and trying to redesign a community that's, that's, that puts product on the back burner and purpose at the foreground. It's, it's, the, it's reverse engineering, really. And the hard part is you can't just tell people that, right? You can't just tell people, like I just did, be selfless, right? Um, you can't um, because people won't listen. Um, and that's fair enough. Uh, but what does work is being the example. Um, and, and I find that when I'm around people who are selfless, I am a lot more selfless. Uh, because, you know, it's really awkward to be the only selfish person in a room. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not about what's being said. It's about actually living and instantiating that value. And... You know, sometimes it's even better if you don't actually say it, you just do it. Um, but sometimes it needs to be said. I know, uh, I know times, times kind of, we've, we've taken about an hour of your time, Dr. Dr. Downs. Um, and as I said before, oh, if I can ask, interrupt, yeah. don't call me doctor. <laughs> I do not have a PhD. So you should not ah. call me doctor. Ah, so pe people make the same mistake with you as they do with me sometimes. Uh, sometimes I sometimes I accept uh, false praise and the, and, uh, and sometimes I correct. So no yeah. worries. I, I, it, it happens all the time, and it's yeah. Just call me Stephen. <laughs> all right, great. Um, well, Stephen, you've been you've been wonderful for us, and I think you you know through Iman uh, something of our project. We're we're broadly looking at right? Future of learning for our particular university a few years from now. Um, you've suggested the difficulty of trying to imagine um, radical transformative change occurring in such a short amount of time. You said certainly it's not going to be ready for September mm -hmm. or, or by Halloween and probably realistically um, this is going to take, this, this may be even generational change that we're talking about here. Uh, but, I, but I wonder sort of in conclusion, if you could share with us, just based on what you know about our project in conversations with Iman and what you've heard today, um, what are some things maybe that, some threads that you're, you'd be interested in pulling if you were on our end uh, in sort of ex exploring this idea um, for community? That's really hard because I'm not as familiar as I would like to be with Kazakhstan. Um, you know, and, and I find that, you know, each, each place has its own local strengths. Well, let's and, say somewhat, sorry, let's say somewhat generically because we have much more familiarity or we're gaining familiarity with our, with our own operation and our, our own perspective. Right. But I guess mm -hmm. it'd be useful to link that to, to some threads that you might pull. Yeah. Well, I mean, but that's that's just it. The the first threads I'd pull would be local threads, the localization. Uh, what unique capabilities are there? Um, you know, and so I can't name them for you because I don't know what they are. But uh, you know, um, 
when I was in uh, New Brunswick, for example, one of the unique thread was the English French bilingualism, um, where people really did work and live in both English and French. And that creates a lot of opportunities and it also creates a lot of capabilities and, and it, it positions New Brunswick right at the right at the crossroads between the English speaking world and the French speaking world. And that was unique. That was that was special, right? So all of a sudden you have a way of bridging, for example, East Africa with West Africa. Uh, East being English speaking and, and or sorry, it's, yeah, and West being French speaking, for example, right? Uh, here now I live in a small town in um, Eastern Ontario, it's farm country, cattle country, uh, a lot of milk, a lot of cheese, um, you know, harvesting grain, things like that. And so I, I look for that kind of strength. Um, you know, um, there's a history of farmers co-ops. Our, our major employer in a place called St. Albert is, is, a, is a cheese cooperative, right? So there's a history of organizing and working together, uh, you know, in what is a very difficult industry. Agriculture is probably the hardest industry there is, and, and that's how they've managed it. And I'd, I'd look for that. Um, you know, every place is different, every perspective is different, and there's something unique everywhere. Um, and you know, I don't know what it is for Kazakhstan. I, I can't tell you. I, I can imagine, like, you know, the, the, the vast plains of Central Asia. There's a lot of history there. There's a lot of movement through the territory there. There are large, wide open spaces. That must mean something, um, you know. Uh, but how that translates into you know, the, the on the ground advantage that you have the, the particular capability um you know it's hard to get a finger on i you know when i you know we started by me saying something like well i hope you get a diversity of opinions from both inside and outside the institution mm -hmm. that's what this process is intended to produce right you, you can't learn about a community without engaging the community. And you can't serve the community without learning about the community. So that to me would be the key thing. Um, you know, I keep trying to tell institutions in this country that, uh, you know, you have to focus on more than just your student body. You, you know, we're looking now at a future where there's going to be a lot of pressure on institutional budgets. You know, we've spent a lot of money during the pandemic and our future is going to be restrained. And there's going to be a lot of pressure to pull back on funding for our institutions. But how do you preserve that? How do you preserve the institution? How do you preserve the support? Well, you have to serve the community that is supporting you. Uh, I read in the Chronicle of Higher Education just a couple of days ago a response against that saying, no, 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 we can't be serving the entire community. We have to retrench and think of ourselves as only academics. That's a good way to become very small and very irrelevant again. Um, and it's also a good way to create a destructive force in society rather than a helpful force in society. There's a long story there. But so I'd be trying to find, you know, we talk about focus on the student, but there's also the focus on the community. I mean, I'd be looking at every way I can to provide ongoing day by day support for the community, not support in, you know, as, as a way of raising revenue or anything like that, but support as how can I make this community better and thereby learn more about the community to make it even better still? And it becomes a symbiotic relationship, right? Where you are a part of the community drawing on the strengths and helping build the strengths, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so Great. much. Thank you so much. Steven, before we just, I know that we are run out of time. So um, I, I know that Ricardo has one uh, uh, question. And after that, I think we'll, we'll conclude our just like wonderful conversation. Yeah, Ricardo. Um, hello, Steven. Thank you so much for your time so far. Um, I have a quick question. Um, I've noticed in your profile that you talk a little bit about uh, e-learning 3.0. I'd mm -hmm. like uh, uh, to know if you could dwell a little bit on it and talk about potentially the disruption, disruptive nat nature that this can, can bring to education. How can we implement it uh, globally? And you were talking about checking the local com communities. So we have to have a global mindset, but has to be localized or, or, yeah. or as economists saying the, the globalization, let's call it in that, in that way. Um, so I just wanted to think a little bit about that and, and share, share, if you could share your views um, sure. on it, especially because you're talking about how, you know, in the future, maybe budgets are not going to be as, as available and we're going to have to potentially scale back. But at the same time, we want to move forward because, you know, the future yeah. is not going to be waiting for us. And so in order to idealize the future in the best way possible, how can we uh, be disruptive? interesting, engaging, how can we uh, create course customization, how can we uh, build upon, you know, the, the, the things that, that AI might eventually bring in education, and how can we use this um, IT-based strategies to kind of uh, draw from expertise that is available everywhere and anywhere, now that we can, for example, just access people like you and have your brilliant inputs in, in without, you know, just at a distance of a click. So um, this was kind of a mix of certain considerations and thoughts and, and kind of a question that I have since I work in, uh, in instructional design and I deal with AV tech all the time and, and I'm trying to, you know, get a sense of what's coming next as well. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. Thanks for the question. And I like the artwork behind you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank <yeah>. you. <laughs> Um, had to say something. Um, I mean, e-learning 3.2 is a collection of, I think, eight or nine ideas. Um, and I'm not going to remember them all off the top of my head because I'm old and fuzzy now. Uh, but um, the overall theme, if I had to give it an overall theme, is kind of like decentralization and disaggregation. Uh, you know, it's kind of like networks applied to society as a whole. Um, you know, there's the old saying, uh, I used to work for an international development center called the Arusha Center. And they had the slogan, and everybody has the slogan, um, think globally, act locally. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming more and more true. And the, the concept of e-learning 3.0 reflects some of that. Um, it reflects some of the redefinitions uh, of learning that we're going to be looking at in the future. The one that right off the top of my mind, and, and I guess maybe what I would consider the most important, is the way we redefine community. Uh, and community plays a big role in education. We know that. We learn in communities and we form learning communities and all of that. But what is it to be a community? In the past, we've defined communities as sameness. Same people, same language, same discipline. Um, but that is becoming less and less the case. Uh, as we become, interestingly, as we become more local, in certain important respects, the communities need to become more diverse. Uh -huh. um, you know, simply because uh, you know different people fill different roles in a small community. You know, there's the, the garage mechanic, there's the grocer, there's the restaurateur, uh, there's the doctor, there's the lawyer. Right? They're all they're all coming from different perspectives and different points of view. And so what does that mean that community is? How do we define community? And again, we used to define community as, well, we're all in the same place. But look at us now. We're, eight, we're nowhere near in the same place. So the concept in e-learning 3.0 is 
community is consensus. And what I mean here is not so much everybody in the community agrees on everything. That's not what I mean. What I mean is the way you define a community is by the way a collection of people makes decisions. The, it's the process that they've undertaken in order to decide what counts as true, what counts as relevant, what counts as evidence, etc. It's that decision-making process. Now, I stole that concept from blockchain, believe it or not, uh, because blockchain networks are basically consensus networks, and they're consensus networks based on uh, well, in the case of Bitcoin, for example, proof of work algorithms, you know, mm -hmm. different algorithms, right? But each one of these communities is defined by the algorithm that defines how it draws a consensus. If we think of a community like that, then our dynamics of the community change, right? The, the important thing becomes how we talk to each other, how we interact, how we make decisions and not what the outcome of these decisions are um, and whether everybody believes the same thing or even whether everybody's trying to work toward the same outcome. Um, so that's part of what I mean by e-learning 3.0. Um, you know, even just, uh, you know, uh, our, our idea of, of learning resources, um, he asked about artificial intelligence specifically. Mm -hmm. In the near future, our educational resources will be automatically created by artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to happen. And it's going to happen because it's easy for AI to do. Um, all AI needs to do is look at some expert content, if you will, and break it down, chunk it up and simplify it, and you have an educational resource. And it can find relevant illustrations and organize them in a logical flow. Uh, you know, we already have AIs writing sports stories for the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Now, a sports story is probably the lowest form of human communication, uh, which is why I like them so much. But it's a starting point, right? You look at all the things that GPT-3 has been doing, right, in creating new content, new, you know, you know, this is not a real person, things like that. And certainly AI has the capacity to draw on knowledge, broadly thought of, to create learning resources. That's gonna put a lot of instructional designers out of work. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, but, but that's the future of the profession. Yeah, I mean, and if you if you do work in the field of DevOps, and I have, right? Um, you know, websites are being automatically created. Um, you know, social media posts are being automatically created. Entire communities are being automatically created. Um, you know, you just push a button and bang, here's your your, your whole new web presence. It, it almost is that automatic. So expect that. Um, now, the other side of that, though, and everybody knows about this, so I'm not saying anything that's new, is uh, the, the ethics of artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, uh, the, the problems with bias and prejudice and inaccurate predictions, um, the misuse of artificial intelligence, the creation of the surveillance society, all of that, right? And, and that's important, and I'm not gonna say it's not important because it is. But what does that mean? Uh, you know, all of this talks about the ways we train artificial intelligence because, you know, I mean, in the future and even today, we don't program computers so much as we train them. Oh uh, yeah, okay, some people, some, some uh, very mathematically oriented people create the algorithms that build these artificial neural networks. And I worked with a bunch of them, you can barely talk to them. Uh, but, uh, you know, mostly the work is involved in training. You give them training data, you run through a whole bunch of iterations over that, and the neural network grows and develops in response to that training data and to the feedback that it receives. 
And that's where so much goes wrong in artificial intelligence. So interestingly, and this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I love saying it for a fact, there will only be one job in the future, and that's teaching. <laughs> because you're teaching artificial intelligences to do different things. And it's, I know it sort of goes against what I said about chemists, but the job of a chemist or a chemistry professor in the future will be to teach artificial intelligences that do new chemical compounds or chemical analysis or spectroscopy or whatever, right? I don't know what chemistry, I'm not a chemist. Um, you know, and now it's an exaggeration, obviously. But it does give us a bit of a different focus on, you know, what it is that we're up to. Um, what we're going to be up to is teaching our machines. How do we teach our machines? Well, again, we're not programming them directly, right? You, you, you know, for the most part, you're not, you know, telling a computer you will behave ethically. You, you can't do that. Uh, you're creating data that the computer will use. So there's only one way to train a computer to behave ethically, and that is to behave ethically. If you behave unethically, it will result in unethical behavior in the computer because it becomes part of the training set. And it's a really odd sort of thing where now our, our, our relations of, of power and control and all, they're all turned upside down. Where the only way we can influence somebody else to do something is to do it ourselves. And it's an odd sort of way of looking at it, but it does, you know, come back to this whole idea of looking at the community and, and, and thinking about how to benefit the wider community. I know it sounds like big circles, but there it is. So the rest of eLearning 3.0, is some of it's more specific, some of it's less specific, but it looks at these, these big society changing moments. Um, that are happening they're all happening right now and and they're all happening people don't see them for what they are mm -hmm. how was that very good but that being said um now i have a follow-up because it's yeah. impossible not to have a follow-up yeah, that's uh, fine i'm fine if we're talking about you know culture localization if we're talking about uh, a myriad of, of, of opportunities that AI might might produce and they, they will have to be uh, produced based on our input then how does that affect uh, curriculum structures brick and mortars assessment you know if, if there's a change that is completely disruptive then yep. the materialization of that change will require a different set of rules for implementation and that implementation is going to be uh, biased because it's will be culturally driven wherever in the planet it's going to be implemented uh, makes yep. sense Yep, mm. totally. Uh, yeah, and all of these change. Another one of the e-learning 3.0 things is assessment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right now we assess by some sort of performance like a test or an assignment or an essay or whatever. Um, and then we give people, you know, course certificates and, and, and diplomas and whatever. Uh, all of that goes away. And it goes away in the first instance because we don't need it anymore. Um, let's look at this particular instance that we're having right now, this conversation that we're having right now. So there's uh, five, six of you and there's me. And the six of you are in a position to be able to assess me, right? And you're asking me questions and I'm responding, but you know, it's not like a test or anything like that. Um, oh, I just saw the little note pop up. Um, and it's fine, I don't mind talking. You get me going, I don't mind talking. So you are all each individually drawing a conclusion whether you want to or not. Um, do I trust this person? Is he credible? Does he know what he's talking about, right? You're all making that judgment. 
Of course you are. I'm making that judgment of you. Sorry, nothing personal. <laughs> uh you know i've noted a variety of different things i look at backgrounds i look at facial expressions i look at the words and there's a whole list of things, right uh those are the sorts of things that would define curriculum and would define testing right mm -hmm. um but none of us is doing that because we don't have to you look the the six of you each individually look and then you'll talk among each other and come to some sort of consensus you look at my performance and you and you recognize either that yes this was a credible performance or no it wasn't this is a flim, shim, or flim flam artist he doesn't know what he's talking about and i've had events where i've been watching a speaker and that's the conclusion i was you know i i hear them talk and say no there's, there's no way this person is making this stuff up as he goes along right and there was a recent u.s president who you could see him making stuff up as he went along being just because of the vocabulary he used the way he responded to questions it'll be good it'll be the best you've ever seen whatever right with no specifics so how does that happen because that's a really fundamental question how does that happen um and i describe it in terms of neural networks we each have a neural network we're each organized a certain way the way we know the way we learn is recognition knowledge is recognition that's another one of the e-learning 3.0 points right and i say that for example to know something is like recognizing your mother if she comes through the bus station right it's not a bunch of rules it's not a test you just look and oh yeah there she is it's instant it's recognized so mm -hmm. um you look at me the overall performance and you either recognize me as somebody who's an expert or you don't or somewhere in between right it's nuanced and in fact that's how we assess people who are in sensitive or high stakes jobs like doctors or lawyers or airline pilots right we don't just give them a test we put them in an actual situation and have other experts look at their performance and say yes this person's a doctor or no this person is not functioning like a doctor we should do that with police but we don't that's in the side uh but are pretty relevant um and so that's what we do well apply that to all of society in a world of artificial intelligence an artificial intelligence is a neural network just like a human brain it's not as smart as a human brain but they're getting better but you can take an artificial intelligence show it somebody doing something a task maybe they're doing surgery maybe they're repairing a pipe who knows and the artificial intelligence can say yes this was a good job or no that was not a good job it's a simple classification exercise ai's are very good at that so broaden that out a bit you're doing your work the way you do uh you know now in the new world of learning you're not producing content just for your teacher but you're putting it on social networks or you're putting it on your website or even better you're probably participating in projects remember the small teams that the instructors build to work on a project right uh so these have public artifacts so there's actually a whole lot of information about you available on the internet and and some information you didn't want that was stolen on, by surveillance let's rule that out we don't even want that right only the information you choose to share right we make that available and then a computer an artificial intelligence looks at that and recognizes that yes you are a practitioner of history yes you are a qualified chemist well right off the bat we think well good we've got automated grading but 
why do we need grades? Well, we need grades in order to give people diplomas. Well, why do, we, why do we need diplomas? Well, employers need diplomas, right? So that they can sort between the qualified and the unqualified people. But an employer can just have a machine that looks at what you've done and do that and do it better than a diploma could. So if we put this capacity in the hand of employers, so if an employer is looking for specific skills, they use this artificial intelligence. This artificial intelligence looks at the published contents of people's websites, their e-portfolios, their contributions to projects, their GitHub repositories, etc. The AI says, this person is qualified, this person is qualified, this person is qualified. You don't need grades, certificates, diplomas, you can skip all of that. As I say now in slogan form, the credential of the future is a job offer, right? We know all the rest that we have in between the learning and the job offer are adaptations we make because we don't have the information capacity to deal with it. But now we do. Now we have a computer program that can look at your entire life's output from when you were a kid to now, or whatever you choose, right? And create a very accurate learning profile of you and find the exact positions that you would be suited in. Now you might think well, that's really unfair. You know, the employers have all the advantage. But now you as an individual learner can access the same program and apply that program to people who are already experts and apply it to yourself, match them up and find out what you need to do in order to become an expert. And it's gonna be different for everybody, isn't it? Of course it is, right? But that's now where we get the support, <coughs> the support for the individual. So, uh, you know, all of this isn't going to be the case in September. It's not going to be the case 10 years ago, but 20 years from now, or 10 years from now, but 20 years from now, this is, to my mind, almost a drop dead certainty that we will have this. I mean, the only thing that, that we can, you know, barring a huge natural disasters, a comet hitting the earth, whatever, um, you know, but, you know, there, there's the only thing that, really could be inaccurate about this prediction to my mind is the timing um and then the effect because there's always the human element what will people think of this how will they respond how will they try to break it how will they try to abuse the system how will they try to take advantage you know you begin you, you ask all of these questions but that overall structure is going to be in place Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, and uh, I'll just words fail me to to thank you enough for your time for for this conversation to take place here. Let's applaud everyone <laughs> to Stephen. Thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we could conclude our conversation today. Uh, <laughs> Thanking you and uh, really you showed in practice this attitude that everyone needs to have uh, caring of each other and uh, as, a, as a building uh, bridge towards this whole community of trust and responsibility and even on different being on different continents it still uh, works. <laughs> so thank you so much again <coughs> and please take care, stay safe and healthy. Oh yeah and um, uh, let's let's have uh, like final final one um, a screen shot of us all. One, two, three, smile. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, you guys all smile like I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. David, they, this was great. Thank you. You get some groups and like it's all teeth. <laughs> 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 all right. Thank you so much again. Have a great day. Thank you, Steven. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Steven. Wonderful.
Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Okay. Um, thank you very much, colleagues as well. Uh, yeah. Is anyone interested in a quick debrief? Does anyone want to? Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, first yeah, of all, yeah, we're here anyway, so might as well. Yeah, right, Ricardo, and uh, thank you. So w the the conversation was good, and it was leading places good, but you took it into that sort of vision space, and it was very very interesting. I thought. Um, uh, but let me just show you what I did, and uh, just so that you see what we've got. Uh, uh, just I have... to stop recording. Oh yeah, maybe stop recording. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Just.